Hello and welcome to Tensar Ground Coffee, a few minutes on ground engineering to enjoy it while having your coffee. Well, we're continuing the Ask Andrew season where you can pose any questions on ground engineering to us and uh, we'll try to answer them. So let's have a look uh, this week. Uh, what have we got here? Um, oh, here's a good one. Uh, this one's from uh, Sandy, Sandy Gravel, and she asks, uh, what is the shear strength of a soil? Uh, that's a good question, a nice fundamental question about the soil mechanics, which of course uh, is very relevant to ground engineering. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that is a good question because when you hear geotechnical engineers, uh, engineering geologists talking about soil strength, they talk in terms of shear strength. So why is that? Why is shear strength not compressive strength or tensile strength, for example? So here's my bowl of sand. You see, uh, soil, such as this sand, is just made up of uh, particles or grains. So always remember in soil mechanics that you are dealing with a granular material. If you always bear that in mind, uh, you shouldn't go too far wrong. Um, even a clay is made up of grains, but you can't see them because they're too small. Now, an arrangement of particles like this does not have any tensile strength because, look, the particles can just be uh, separated easily. Also, the compressive strength of these particles, which are quite hard, there are some sands uh, which are more friable, uh, made out of little shells, but a, a sand most sands like this, the most uh, soils, the particles are very hard and actually these are too small to see what's happening, but we're not going to crush these. If you imagine we had a gravel here, in typical geotechnical applications, you're not going to crush the gravel. So when you apply a load uh, to a soil, eventually it will fail and it will fail by shear, which means that the particles are moving relative to each other. Now, when they move relative to each other, they're sliding over each other, and that is a shear uh, type of failure. That's, uh, that's why we talk in terms of shear failure or a shear strength of soil. And where does the strength come from? It comes from friction. Friction and a little bit of interlock on uh, the larger particles. So we are dealing with a frictional material, which makes it quite difficult to characterize that strength because friction varies with the stress that is uh, applied across a surface. Let's do a quick revision of what uh, friction is all about. So let's take away our sand. Let's bring in a box file here with a coaster on the top here. So the coaster has uh, two different surfaces. The hard surfaces here that the drink goes on, you see that the friction here is not that high. But on here, the friction is uh, higher. So between different surfaces, you get different uh, friction properties. So when we look at a soil, we've got the friction between the grains that we need to consider. When we characterize friction, we know that the force, the sliding force, or you could consider it as a shear force between the coaster and the box file, depends on the normal force here. So a very small force is required to slide that coaster along there. If I put um, a bit of extra normal force on here, perpendicular to the plane, now I need a bigger force to make it slide. So the force, the failure force of this interface gets bigger as this normal force increases. So that is a particular feature of uh, frictional interfaces. So in a soil, we see similar behavior. The, the shear stress, which is what this is, within the soil to make soil slide over each other gets bigger as the normal force or normal stress gets bigger. So let's, uh, let's, go, over to the, uh, let's go over to the flip chart, Brian, and uh, let's have a little look at how we characterize the strength, the shear strength of a soil based around friction. Uh, before I do that, let me just draw some examples of shear failure uh, that happens in ground engineering. So uh, here we have a, a ground surface. Imagine we had a foundation here and we applied a big load to it. If that failed, 
we would get a shear failure, something like that. So there is an example of how it fails. It doesn't fail in compression or tension of the soil material. Actually, the soil slides over itself. So that plane can be considered as a shear plane. Another example is a, uh, a retaining wall. Imagine we had a gravity retaining wall here. If that were to slide forward due to the uh, lateral earth pressure on the back, we would actually get a type of, uh, we get sliding here, so we get a friction between the structure and the soil, which is uh, one type of friction. And we would also get what we call an internal friction, uh, an internal shear failure here within the soil, because as that wall moves forward, this soil will collapse under its own weight. It will move down and we'll get a shear plane there. So those are examples of shear planes within a soil in typical uh, geotechnical structures. The way we uh, measure and characterize soil strength is just like the, the frictional relationship you, uh, we described there with the box file. So as the normal stress inside a soil gets higher, normal stress sigma, and if we use the prime for effective stress, so that's the actual stress between the particles, uh, taking out the effect of pore water. As we go along here, the stress is getting higher. This is equivalent to going deeper down into the soil. So when we're down here, we have all this self weight of soil above, and that creates a high normal stress. As we go further down, we're getting more weight of soil. And as we're at the top, when we're at the top here, there's nothing above here. So the effective stress is zero, would be here. As we go down deeper into the soil, we're getting more and more uh, effective stress. On the vertical axis, we can plot the shear stress, which uh, is what is being generated along here. And this is uh, at the point of failure. So tau is what we use to represent the shear stress. So the, the failure plane uh, actually becomes a what we often assume is a straight line. Often it's not quite straight, but it has a slope. That will make, that's what's unusual about soil strength. A little bit different to how we characterize the strength of structural materials. Because soil is purely a frictional material, when you have zero effective stress, you have zero shear strength. You can't sustain any shear stress. You need that confining stress to generate shear strength. So it's going up all the time. So we can't express soil strength as a single value of shear stress because it's changing. Uh, so we express it as this slope here or as an angle phi with a prime to show that it's in terms of effective stress. So soil strength is actually expressed as a friction angle. So that makes it a very unusual material for, for use in uh, construction. You can get a bit of an intercept here. Um, that's called the cohesion, C. Uh, but be careful with that. You may get a little bit of apparent cohesion on a, on a particularly on a dense granular material where the grains are quite large. Uh, you may get a, a, a high, it'll be a higher friction angle. So a clay would have a lower friction angle. Uh, granular materials and gravels will have a higher friction angle. You may get, uh, whoops, that should continue straight. You may get a small cohesion value C. In reality, the line is curving down to the origin. You're just getting a bit of non-linearity in the profile. Using C might be okay in most designs, as long as it's not too high. If you get test results that show a very high cohesion value, be suspicious of them. Maybe it was a partially saturated um, fine grain specimen, maybe that's where it came from, in which case you can't really rely on it because moisture changes might actually mean you lose that, that extra strength. So be suspicious of very high values. It's always safest to take it as zero if you're in any doubt. That's how we measure it and that's how it works in granular materials where the permeability is high uh, because uh, water can move around instantly. So any changes in load, such as from a foundation, 
uh, the effective stress changes almost immediately because um, the, uh, the water can flow around within the sand. It gets a bit different in clays because um, if we were to apply this foundation load on a clay, that load gets transferred to the water in the pores because water is incompressible. So the, uh, the total stress changes because you're adding this load, but the stress between the soil particles in the soil skeleton does not change. So we get something slightly different for short-term undrained strengths in a clay. I'm running out of space there, so it's a bit short, but here on the horizontal axis, this will be sigma, but without the prime. This is total stress this time, but against shear stress again, tau. Um, the strength of the clay will depend on the effective stress state within that soil at that particular time uh, that has developed. When we add a load and the total stress changes along here, because it's only happening in the water, it doesn't actually change the strength. So we get actually a constant shear strength and a horizontal line that is called the undrained shear strength often called CU or sometimes SU. So lowercase CU or SU, they are the same thing, undrained shear strength. And this is an example where we do get a single value of shear stress applicable for the clay on the site. Um, that is applicable in the short term because as I said, when you apply a load here, the total stress changes, but the effective stress does not. So you only go up and down if the effective stress changes. If it's uh, total stress in the short term, there's no change in effective stress, the strength stays the same, and you can use that in design. In the long term, the strength will change. Uh, so a couple of things to be careful of, uh, at least, about uh, uh, using this in, uh, in design. Bear in mind that this is not a fundamental soil property. This depends on the stress state and the moisture state of a clay soil. So it, uh, it will change. If the moisture conditions change here, then the strength will change. So be careful about uh, using these values. The other thing is that uh, the strength will change over time. So in the case of a foundation loading, whenever you are loading a clay, with time, effective stress will increase and you will get an increase in strength. So in a foundation problem, uh, shear strength, in this case bearing capacity, will increase over time uh, uh, in mo very, almost all cases. If you have an unloading problem, such as an excavation or a cutting slope where you unload the soil, over time, slowly the clay will actually swell and so you'll be getting a reduction in effective stress so the strength will actually decrease with time. So actually long term is more critical than short term when you are unloading the soil or but when you're loading the soil like in a foundation short term is more critical in most cases it gets a little bit more complicated when the clay is highly over consolidated okay it's a big topic uh but uh it's a quick overview and i hope you uh appreciated that uh that's all for this episode of tensile ground coffee thanks for watching and see you next time